Wow, what a great night, huh? It's uh, just been jam-packed full of some wonderful stuff, and uh, what a great opportunity. Thank you for coming out in spite of the rain, in spite of the cold outside. We are so honored to be able to worship together with you. King of Kings family, great to see your faces. And all of you that are joining us online, welcome from around the world. And thank you for allowing us to celebrate together God's faithfulness in our lives and giving us this opportunity to worship together and to celebrate his goodness and to take a couple of moments to just pause and to uh, slow down along the journey and to be able to step back for a second and look at everything that God has done up until this point to acknowledge God's faithfulness in Jimmy Cathy's life, in uh, Wayne and Anne's life, in the life of King of Kings, and in our community, and to be able to embrace some of those things. And this isn't to say that this is it. This isn't the, the end, like a celebration that's over. This is actually so that we can stop and pause for a couple of moments and say, wow, look at everything that God has done up until this point, and because he's been so faithful to this spot, as we look forward, we know that God has great things in front of us, even better things in front of us. And though it sounds cliche, because I know it is cliche, the best is yet to come, really. As we look forward, the best that God has for us is still in front of us. We haven't possessed all of our territory yet. So let me ask you, when you began following the Lord, when he tapped you and called you into service to be a part of his family, and you said, yes, I'll follow you for the rest of my life, at that spot, did you know everything that was going to be a part of your journey? Could you see what the future was going to hold for you? And now today, as you've walked some distance with the Lord, and you can see everything that he's done up until this spot, and now you're looking at the future, can you see exactly what he has in front of you? Can you tell us today the precise and the exact details and looking forward into that future? What does that future look like? How do you know what God has in front of you? I'm sure if we could somehow dial back to those first few moments as King of Kings was being talked about, as it was being birthed, and those moments of vision and dreaming that Pastor Wayne and Ann were just speaking about, if you could go back to those moments, I'm guaranteeing you that most of those folks, and we heard it there tonight, would actually say they had no idea everything that God had planned for King of Kings. They didn't understand the full picture. They couldn't understand everything that God had in front of them. And yet, isn't this the way that it always works? God calls his people out. He calls us up to be a part of what he's doing in the earth, to be a part of the activity and the action on the earth. And we only get glimpses. We get little pictures, snips of pictures there and there to, to fully fill in the picture, to understand what is it that this is going to be that God is calling me to. And that means we don't get to see the end from the beginning. We can't see the end. We can only see the beginning and little glimpses of the things that maybe the future holds. And then that means we begin to live in obedience. We begin to walk and to live by faith because we are people of faith. God has called us to be people of faith. Faith, believing in faith that there is more, more in front of us that God has for us to experience and more than we can actually see with our physical eyes, more to the plan than that we can perceive or comprehend with our finite minds. Paul speaks at this faith reality that makes up our lives as followers of Messiah. In 1 Corinthians 2, he says, we declare God's wisdom. It's a mystery that has been hidden and that God has determined uh, destined for our glory before time began. So even before time began, God destined things in front of you and me and us for glory that we can't even comprehend yet. Paul goes on and says, none of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would have not crucified the Lord of glory. However, Paul says, as it is written, what no eye has seen, 
what no ear has heard and what no mind has, human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him. These are the things, he says, that God has revealed to us by his spirit. So God giving us pictures, revealing to us understandings of those things, we can't exactly embrace them yet, but by faith, we know that they're there. By faith, we continue to walk towards those things. So Paul, with this provocative statement, is trying to get us to look beyond what our eyes can see and to begin to grab a hold of that eternal world and to embrace with the eyes of our heart the unseen world, God's kingdom, God's world, and the glories that lie in front of us as we journey and we walk together with the Lord. Over the past several weeks, we've been going through a series that we're calling Behind the Scene, S-E-E-N. And with this play on words, what we've been doing is trying to describe the massive, eternal, unseen, spiritual world that impacts and influences all of our physical world, our physical and temporal lives. The two worlds existing side by side, simultaneously, and in tandem, working together to accomplish and to uh, do God's will. But with this idea and with this understanding that Pastor Chad has been bringing out over the last several weeks, that it's the unseen world where all the action is. This is where the, the good stuff is happening. There's so much going on there all the time. And as Pastor Chad pointed out in our first few weeks, most of what God does, the majority of what God does is done there in that unseen world. It's a dimension that we can't see with our human eyes, but it is a dimension that we can see and we're supposed to see with the eyes of our heart, with the eyes of faith as we continue to walk with the Lord and, and embrace it with eyes of faith. Sometimes I imagine that many of us feel like the guy here who went to go see his psychiatrist and he says to the doctor, I've been seeing this woman for a few months now and everything's going really well. The problem is nobody else can see her yet. This is our reality. When we talk about our unseen world, yes, we know it exists, but if you tell, tell that to an unbeliever, they're gonna say to you, hmm, maybe you should go see your psychiatrist. Our primary text over this series has been from 2 Corinthians. And Paul is trying to give us perspective. He's wanting to broaden our perspective. And he says to us, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us, are achieving for us, are accomplishing for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So he says, we fix our eyes not on, on what's seen, but on what is unseen, behind the scene, so that we don't uh, live by what is seen and temporary, but we live by what is unseen and eternal. Paul is, is broadening our perspective. He's trying to get us to look beyond what we can see with our physical eyes and encouraging us and reminding us that God's true world is seen with our spiritual eyes. It's a world that will never end. It's timeless. And here, again, Paul is trying to remind us and encouraging us really that everything that we see with our temporal eyes, our physical eyes, in this earth life, it's dated. It has a date on it. It's not gonna last forever. It's gonna die, it's gonna pass away. It will come to an end. But God's eternal kingdom, our eternal home, will never end. Those things that no eye has seen, those things that no ear has heard, those things are never going to pass away, meaning that the majority of our lives, what really matters in the majority of our lives is beyond the realm of what we can see. Like an iceberg, the greatest portion of our reality lives just outside of our eyesight so that we live in a reality that physically we can't see every piece and part of our eternal life, but we know it exists. When God created our temporal, physical world, he created and established a thing that, that we call time. 
It allows us to govern and helps us measure our, our existence, our physical existence on the earth. The going down of the sun and the rising up of the sun is a, a day. A day that we've measured and then divided into 24 segments or 24 hours. A day adds up to weeks, weeks add up to months, months add up to years, and so on. All along, though, God himself remains outside of time. God is timeless, meaning that he isn't bound by the same realities that we know as time. He's the God of yesterday. He's the God of today. He's the God of tomorrow and forever. He's the God of all of those all at once. He can be any of where, any, any of those places at any time because he's omnipresent. He's not bound by time. So he is standing clear back at the beginning of time and can see that just like he can see the end of time. He's timeless. And he exists in a way so that he can see the beginning from the end and the end from the beginning. And yet, even though God is timeless, it's important for us to understand and to grab a hold of that God and the heavenly realm don't just float around out there without some kind of boundaries or definition or sequence of time. Rather, he operates, God operates according to his heavenly and eternal schedule, his eternal calendar, a, a time frame that's always been in motion. The real time, the real measure of sequence and order. And it's crucial for us to grab a hold of this tonight, to grab a hold of this reality that our time doesn't match God's time. Time in God's sight looks different than time in our sight. Because we often get frustrated with God's timing. God's eternal time and calendar is something that frustrates most believers, most human beings. Because we somehow, we, we want to fit God into our calendar, our schedule, our time, thinking somehow that our time frame are the time frames that matter. Our time frame is the true time. It's the real measurement of time. When all along the real truth is that God's eternal heavenly calendar has always been and always will be the real measure of time and sequence and order. And it's reality, God's calendar reality, over or supersedes and surpasses our physical calendar. It determines and it dictates our earthly physical measurement of time. If we don't grasp a hold of this reality, we're always going to be frustrated as we walk with the Lord because his time is never going to work with our time. It's never going to match our expectations. It's always going to be out of sync. It's never going to be right. God is never going to get it right. Habakkuk says, this is the Lord talking, and he says in Habakkuk 2, write down the revelation and make it plain on tablets so that the herald may run with it. For the revelation awaits an appointed time. It speaks of the end, and it will not prove false. Though it linger, wait for it. It will certainly come and will not delay. How often has God asked us to wait and to linger and to pause and to hold on for his timing, which feels like it's never on time. It feels like God's always not on time, but he's not on our time. Yeshua describing the day of the Lord in Matthew 24 and, and in Mark 13 says, Yeshua says, no one knows about the day of the, uh, or the hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. We don't know the day and the hour. God is operating by an eternal time frame, and he's the one that knows it, an eternal schedule that he's the, the author of. He's not the keeper of a schedule that's been given to him. He's the author of the schedule. He's the one that's making it operate. He's the one that's making the plan work. And he measures his time in seasons and in ages and epochs, precisely accomplishing piece by piece his long-held plans, his desires, as his calendar moves forward 
a moment at a time. Now, even though God's time isn't our time, he's caused the two times to overlap, to work together in tandem as we operate and we function in both of those realities. So tonight's message, the title for our message tonight is The Times of Our Lives. We're impacted by that eternal uh, calendar of God. At the same time, we function with the earthly physical time of seconds and minutes and hours. And the two overlap as God gave to mankind through Israel, through the Jewish people, a sequence of days and holidays and festivals to mark and to denote our, our relationship and the events of our relationship of worshiping and following him. Try, tying the two pieces together, the two measurements together in a way, that eternal with that uh, temporal, the, the eternal setting the pace, setting the temperature and impacting the temporal. So that we see in Numbers, Numbers 28 and 29, God outlines and he details for Israel and, and really for all mankind, his set times, his prearranged, prescribed calendar times. The, the things that are on his calendar that we can't see, but we can see these events, these days, these holidays, these festivals, daily, weekly, monthly, yearly feasts and commemorations, the cyclical Shemitah of rest once every seven years, and then seven Shemitah cycles in a row for 50 years in that 50-year jubilee. All of these are a part of God's calendar, and, and he's set them into our calendar, our time frame, so that we can know what he's up to so that we can see where we are in time, so that we can understand what is important to God and we can also understand what we're supposed to be doing with the time that God's given to us. But here's the thing about time, our earthly time, our physical time, the way time works. For most people, time is something that is really a, a, a bother to us. We find it very frustrating. And here's what I mean. We, we can't control time, and we want to control time. See, with, with most of us, time is one of those things that we either have too much of or we have too little of. But very little time is right there in the middle where we're happy with exactly how much we have. We either have too little or we have too much, or it goes too fast or it goes too slow. We're almost always never happy with the time that God has given to us and the way time works and the way time flows. I remember just those first few days of the war. I'm going to tell on myself for just a moment. Those first few days of the war and we're hearing about and seeing some of the most unbelievable things in our lifetime that have taken place just a few days before. And I remember it just kept coming up into my mind and into my spirit. I just kept thinking, we've got to rewind. We've got to somehow go backwards. We just need to hit that reset button and go back and make this all not happen. Somehow I wanted to stop the marching on of time and to undo what had already been done. I'm sure I wasn't the only one. But it shouldn't surprise us then that one of the most popular genres for books and movies is the, the genre of time travel. We love the idea of time travel with movies like The Time Bandits and About Time and The Edge of Tomorrow, the whole Terminator series. I haven't seen them all, and don't judge me. <laughs> Groundhog Day and the Back to the Future series and Men in Black and on and on. We, we love this genre. We love the idea that we could somehow be anywhere we want to be in time, anytime we wanted to be there. To be like God, to be omnipresent, to be unrestrained by the earthly confines of our time. Did you know that Satan can't be anywhere he wants to be anytime he wants to be there? He can't be in the past, the present, and the future all at the same time. He is not omnipresent. Only God is. 
We're not. Satan's not. But God is. Peter reminds us in 2 Peter 3, with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years. And a thousand years are like a day. Ecclesiastes 8 says to us, no one has power over the wind to contain it. So no one has the power over time, the time of their death. We can't control time. But the truth is, we aren't called to control time. It's just what we want to do, but not, we're not called to do and, and to control time. Rather, God has given us time to steward. God has given us time to use this physical earthly time. Yeshua in John uh, 9 says, we must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when we can do no more work. We need to use our time. Paul says in Ephesians 5, make the best use of the time because the days are evil. Colossians 4, Paul again reminding us, walk in wisdom towards the outsiders, making the best use of the time. And Ecclesiastes 9 kind of sums this up for us. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all of your might. For in that realm of the dead where you are going, there's neither working, nor planning, nor knowledge, nor wisdom. That eternal place, time doesn't exist. So work now while you have the time. But even though our physical earthly time is temporal and it won't be a part of our eternal existence, thank you God, God has given us time now in this earthly life to measure our time on the earth and to use and to steward time to make the most of every opportunity, time to be productive and not lazy, time to fill the earth and to subdue it and to multiply and to be fruitful and to cultivate God's earth. So let's look at God, the, let's look at the first key point tonight. Our earthly time is something that God has given to us to be used, not to be controlled. And we wisely, as we wisely use the time of God, that God has given us, his eternal clock, his eternal calendar is being accomplished. God gives us these talents of silver to invest and to use throughout our lifetime. Time is one of those silver talents that he's given us to use and to steward. So God's eternal time calendar, the schedule that God has designed himself, the schedule that he has operated by moment by moment all throughout eternity, isn't something that we can see. We can't see God's eternal time calendar exactly. It's not a part of our seen world. It's a part of God's unseen world. And so our human eyes are not able to comprehend it. And yet, it's not something that God is trying to hide from us. He doesn't hide it so that we can't see what his calendar is. He wants us to see his calendar. The truth is God wants us to discover it, to know it, to live by it, to see it, to understand it and to incorporate it into our daily lives, our lives of walking by faith. He wants us to understand so that we can see what he's doing in the earth. We can see what he's about to do in the earth so that we can understand our part and we can get ready for the future that's in front of us. And it's all right here, right in God's word. Whether it's Yeshua in Matthew 24 describing what it's going to look like to live in the end of days, or the prophecies all throughout the first covenant, especially Daniel and Isaiah, Jeremiah, the minor prophets, all giving us pictures and snippets of what we can look forward to in our end days, or Peter's highlights of the end day realities in the book of Second Peter, or the book of Revelation that's packed full of dramatic descriptions of what the days in front of us look like. Many of Paul's writing, many of the Psalms, all of God's word points us to the future. 
Not in fullness. We don't get to see the exact moments and names and dates and people and, and so on. But it's there for us to explore and to uncover and to find out and to then begin live by and to apply it to our faith walk with the Lord. We can't predict the future. We're, we're not even meant to predict the future. So many believers seem to think that God puts these pieces in the Bible so that we can put them together like a puzzle and we can say, this is what God's going to do. That's not what God's plan is. He doesn't want us to see every single thing. He holds the future. The future's his. Rather, he, ex- he invites us to grab a hold of those pieces and by faith to begin to walk with them and as God's people to proclaim his truth, proclaim the, the things that he's trying not to hide from our eyes. God gl- gives us glimpses of, and snapshots of the future. And then Paul says, we see in part, we know in part, God's giving us snips and pictures and clips of the future. The biblical model shows us that God is always having us as his people looking forward to the future, trying to give us information and pictures and understanding so that we can live wisely, so that we can live into the time that he's given us and work towards the future and prepare our hearts for what's in front of us so that we can be ready for everything that is a part of his calendar. See, Noah couldn't see the future, but God forewarned him. Hebrews 11 tells us that by faith, Noah when warned about things that had not yet been seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his entire family. Abraham couldn't see the future. He couldn't predict it, but God guided him and instructed him, go to a land that I'll show you. Hebrews 11 tells us that by faith, Abraham, when called to go to the place that he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed, and he went, even though he didn't know where he was going. Later, God uh, also warns Sodom and Gomorrah, warns Abraham about Sodom and Gomorrah. Joseph couldn't see the future, but God dropped dreams into his heart, began to give him pictures of what the future was going to look like, which kept him solid, holding on to God through those years of slavery and of rejection. Pharaoh couldn't see the future. Nebuchadnezzar couldn't see the future. But God warned them, put dreams in their hearts, sent Joseph to interpret the dream for Pharaoh and Daniel, to interpret the dream for Nebuchadnezzar, preparing them for the future, what was going to happen. So God wanted them to know the future. Our key, second key point tonight is this. God is not hiding the future from those of us who are walking with him. Rather, he invites us to explore, to hunt out, and to discover his future so that we can live into it and we can be prepared. God desires for us to see beyond the temporal. He wants us to know the future. He wants us to know the, the, the outlines, not the details, but fragments and understand so that we can have enough information to live into the future that he's given to us and we can walk by faith because God owns the future and he wants us to be prepared. God owns your future. In fact, God's already there, already ahead of you. He's carving out and he's already carved out and prepared for you, prepared for me, uh, a future with him. He's already there. He's timeless. The table is set. The table of his delights has already been set for you and for me. So as we wrap this up tonight, I'm going to invite our musicians to come back up. How do we pull all these thoughts together? We're living in two separate realities, two separate times. God's eternal time clock, his eternal calendar, and his earthly time that he's given to us to live here on the earth. We're meant to live and uh, survive and thrive in both of those realities, using the times that God has given us to prepare and to live into 
what he's doing on his eternal time calendar. And the more, uh, the more than ever, I'm sensing, as we're walking through these very difficult days, I'm sensing that God is trying to remind us of something. He's trying to remind us that we are people of faith. We're meant to walk with our eyes on the eternal, with our eyes of faith on his calendar, on his time schedule, not on the temporal, physical things that are happening around us. The way I see it is this, as the days continue to grow darker, they're gonna get darker spiritually around us. They may even get darker physically around us. But the point is this, as the days get darker, we can't continue to walk by what we see with our physical eyes. It's gonna be so dark that we're gonna stumble and we're gonna get lost, we're gonna fall. If we're not following and listening to God's time calendar, if we're looking at our, the, the things that our temporal eyes can see and fix on, we're gonna completely miss God in the future that we're stepping into. And God wants us to be people of faith. He wants us to know what that future holds. Not every single detail, but to grab a hold of piece by piece and to step into it, live into it, walk in faith into it, so that as the world around us gets dark, we can still walk with our physical eyes closed, maybe not literally, but we're not looking at the, the physical realm, but we're walking by faith in a darkness that tells us we can't see what's going on, but we can with our spiritual eyes. So let me ask you, what does your future look like going forward? What does it look like beyond this spot? Do you know everything that God has for you in your journey? Hopefully tonight you heard that God holds amazing things in front of you. God's already there. He's already set the table. Your name tag is already there on the table. He's already set that mansion in glory for you and for me. But we still have to get there. We still have to walk in faith. We still have to believe through the unbelievable and continue to hold on to and grasp a hold of that eternal time calendar and apply it to our physical lives. Paul, excuse me, Yeshua describes for us the day of the Lord in Matthew 24. And he says this to us. He says, stay awake, be alert. This is the message version. He says, you have no idea what day your master will show up, but you do know this. So we don't know the details, but we do know this. He says, you know that if the, the homeowner had known what time of night the burglar would arrive, he would have been there with his dogs to prevent the break-in. Be vigilant, Yeshua says, just like that. You have no idea when the Son of Man is going to show up. This is what God wants from us as his people in these days, to be vigilant, to have our eyes on the eternal, God's eternal time calendar, and not on the physical, to not get frustrated with the time of our lives and the way God works and the way God answers and the way he moves and doesn't move, but to keep our, our focus and our heart on those schedules of the Lord, those times of the Lord. Would you stand with me? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the calendar of God that exists eternally outside of what we can see. Lord, we want to submit our lives again to that calendar tonight. Father, we're asking you for the grace, the wisdom, the faith, the ability to see what our physical eyes can't see and to embrace with the eyes of our heart all that you have for us and to be able to proclaim with great clarity, you have great things in store for us. The future that you have in store for us is beyond our understanding, beyond what our eyes, our ears, our minds can conceive. So God help us to embrace that tonight. 
bless us with that grace. Now in Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Lord bless you. Let's continue to worship together.